Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started just to make sure that we stay on time. Um, just want to start off by saying good morning, afternoon, and or evening, depending on where you're from. We have a couple of countries outside of the U.S. joining us, one as far as Australia, so they are probably in their nighttime right now, actually. Uh, my name is Stephanie Pierce, and I am the planning committee chair of this year's conference. I and my fellow planning committee members are thrilled to host you all virtually this week after quite an interesting year, I think we can all agree. Um, this particular conference was supposed to go on last year, but due to the pandemic, we uh, decided to cancel last year's event and build on what we did last year to bring to you this year in a whole different format. Um, before we open things up with our keynote session, I want to take a few minutes to thank several people and institutions who made this week possible, as well as go over some conference information. First up, we need to thank our institutional sponsors, University of Arkansas University Libraries, NC State University Libraries, and University of Arkansas Global Campus. None of this would be possible without their financial and leadership support, especially since they stuck with us over this last year. This has actually been a two-year planning process. Um, and they were like, you still got it. So we were able to keep going. Next up, I want to thank my fellow 2021 planning committee members who kept me sane and on task as the chair. Um, as I'm sure a few of you know, planning a conference is not easy and does take quite a bit of time commitment. These individuals volunteered their time and energies, which I will forever be grateful for. And our biggest thanks goes to our 2021 program committee. They really understood their assignment of creating an engaging program that would benefit a variety of audiences and support our mission to highlight different voices and experiences, especially for those who have not had a chance to speak at an open education conference before. One of the things we knew when we started planning this conference two years ago is we wanted to engage with students more directly. One way we thought we could do this, besides the student panel that is part of this keynote session, was holding a 2021 logo design contest for undergraduate and graduate students. We had a lot of excellent submissions, but our winning design seen here on the screen and across our conference sites ended up being designed by Rebecca McDaniel, who is a student here at my home institution, University of Arkansas. Rebecca hopes to pursue a career as a brand designer upon graduation. Now quickly, let's go over some important conference logistics. All live sessions are being hosted through Zoom webinars like this one here. You'll be able to access each session's webinar link 10 minutes prior to the start from the Whova agenda. Our live agenda consists of 25 minute presentations and 50 minute panels. All speakers have been requested to leave time for Q&A. Unless you are presenting, you will not have access to your microphone. This is purely to help us stay on time. To engage with our speakers, we ask that you submit your questions through Zoom's Q&A feature or in the chat. Our webinar hosts will help moderate these for our speakers. Finally, all sessions are being recorded unless the speakers have requested us not to. You will be notified when you join a webinar that it is being recorded. All recorded sessions will be shared openly on the OESS's YouTube page about a month after the symposium ends. We have instituted a code of conduct this year and for all future OESS events. A shortened version of our COC will be read by each live session's host 
before our speakers begin. I will now read the statement myself. The Open Education Southern Symposium, OESS, strives to offer an open, inclusive, and friendly environment for all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment free of any type of harassment by being mindful of the space and time you're taking up, being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege, being considerate of others' desires for privacy, being respectful of others and accepting that differences in opinion and circumstances create a stronger collaborative environment, actively challenging individual biases and assumptions. Our full COC can be read on our Whova event homepage, as well as on our website. I will be linking to the full code of conduct in the chat. This concludes my welcome on behalf of the planning committee and program committee, as well as the introduction to the symposium. I would like to now turn it over to our keynote speaker, Anita Walls who is Assistant Director of Open Education and Scholarly Communication Librarian at Virginia Tech University. Anita will speak for about 30 minutes before moderating a panel of student leaders and open education advocates. A 10 to 15 minute Q&A will follow. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Anita. Thank you. What a treat it is to be with you today. Uh, thank you so much, Stephanie, and the program and planning committees for the invitation and all the work that you've done behind the scenes. Um, before I get started, I would love to get to know you a little bit, who's here. Um, so if you would um, please use the, uh, the link that is in the chat, the QR code or the, um, menti.com and the code 15930745. Um, that will bring you to two questions um, about your um, type of institution that you, about your affiliation and also about your role. This will help me a lot to know um, how, how more specifically to, um, to relate the content that I'm about to share with you. So um, take a moment to do that. Uh, I'm going to pull up the live results so we can see what's happening. So our first question is, um, uh, sorry, familiarity with the open education. Uh, and Okay, we have a couple responses. That's great. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna. As you're doing this, I'm going to, um, to get started with a short, short introduction. Um, my name, as Stephanie mentioned, my name is Anita Wells. I'm the assistant director of Open Education and Scholarly Communication Librarian at Virginia Tech, where I've worked for the past eight years. I also maintain uh, liaison responsibilities to the Department of Economics. Um, and faculty who are involved in legal studies, but my primary role is to lead and direct open education initiatives, programming, strategy, and implementation at Virginia Tech. In this role, I, and in cooperation with faculty and students, have developed um, 10, um, around 10, um, openly licensed and publicly shared open educational resources. Um, some of these are featured at the link that I'm sharing with you, we have about 11 works that are, um, 11 projects that are currently in the works. Um, so I'm seeing people are still responding, thank you. Uh, so um, we have, have people who um, have a lot of different, um, lots of different areas of, of interest, Lots of strong understanding, lots of philosophical alignment, lots of plans, um, but some who are new, welcome. Um, if you're new to this conversation, um, it's always a first day for everyone. Um, and let's take a look at the question number two to see uh, how people are responding here. Okay, so 
we have lots of librarians, some faculty, some administrators, and um, instructional designers, some students, thanks for being here, um, consortium nonprofit managers and others. Okay, thank you very much. This is very helpful um, for me in knowing um, who you are and what might be relevant to you. So, so I find this work to be, we'll skip through these. Um, I find this work to be challenging, um, mostly in a good way. Um, it's valuable to others and I learn a lot as I work with a lot of people around course materials and instructional issues. Um, I have lifelong interest in economic development, poverty alleviation, and the public good. My Christian faith influences much of my orientation toward all people being deserving of respect, opportunity, and care. Um, before I came to librarianship, I worked in the consulting industry, focusing on economic research and feasibility studies for public, private, and nonprofit ent entities. So my interests have immersed me in experiences and in intern around the world um, in Manila, Philippines, um, in African-American and first-generation Mexican communities in Chicago and then DC to the World Bank, which is like being in all the countries at the same time, um, to Central Asia and most um, recently to Virginia Tech. Um, so the talk that I'm giving today is on open connections, um, regional and local community building for equity and sustainability. Um, so when we are talking about these, about open education, we often default to the, the question of cost. Are we doing this, um, this work um, predominantly for cost um, because course materials are too expensive? Well, let's take a look at what's happening with course materials um, in comparison to inflation. Course materials is this kind of brownish line that uh, seems to be flattening out a bit starting around 2016 or so. Um, lots of different reasons why. Um, but the costs are annual costs are down to around 481 on average for course materials, um, according to the student monitor lifestyle and media reports. Um, <laughs> I see your message stuff. Um, these are these are down, but still very far above the rate of inflation, and not really going down much further. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Um, course materials are still an issue for undergraduate and graduate students. Um, Virginia Tech. Graduate school did an or graduate student assembly did a survey of grad students looking at their costs versus the stipend that they receive as graduate students. This is without course materials. Um, all of their living expenses without even without course materials did not meet the the baseline for the stipend that they received. Um, so these are issues for not only undergrads but for grad students. Um, these issues remain. Other, other things <laughs> have happened between 2010 and 2020, um, including student debt um, doubling essentially since 2010. The pandemic, of course, has not helped uh, with regard to students, student debt being in forbearance, um, loans, educational loans being underwater larger than they, than they were before, and loans to Black borrowers having balances that are larger than the original. These are pretty sobering um, details that does say we still have a problem. Um, we'll skip that because I talked about that, about that already. So I wanna to talk to you about building, how we build, um, what we do. For, with regard to building open educational resources and communities, when we prepare to build anything, it's important to look at the potential impacts and the long-term sustainability of our initiatives. Whether this be a house, a learning community, an affordability program, an open educational resource, the questions are largely the same. Who's it for? Will it meet their needs? Did we ask them what they need, what they want? 
Um, did we involve them in the design? Um, is it stable um, of technical good quality? Um, what sort of maintenance is it going to need over time? So things don't last forever. How long do we plan to maintain this? Um, what, what kinds of care and feeding will it need? We often think that open education is all about content, course content, and only course content. It is, but it is also about looking outward. Um, open education in a lot of ways <clears throat> is not for us. Um, it's about being outward facing and student focused. It's about sharing with the public. If we create great things, we only share them in our institution. What, <laughs> no one else can get to them. There, there's not a lot of shared benefit if we don't further share. Open education is about removing barriers to access, to accessibility, uh, to read uh, students who need different formats. Um, it's about holding a posture of learning that we welcome feedback, we share, we, we exhibit transparency. It's also about new ideas in teaching and learning, including those regarding course materials, how we develop them, if we develop them, if we ask students to develop them as part of their learning. Uh, it's about respect, giving credit, and leveraging technology. It's not a replacement for adequately funded institutions. Um, I think sometimes our, our institutions say, oh, well, we can save a lot of money, um, but this really is to supplement the, what is going on in our institutions. Most of all, I would like to argue that open education is about people and that it's not a solo venture. Um, so I wanna do something um, in a minute that will go through a number of different case studies. Um, and some of the things that I want you to think about as you're listening to these are, how is this a community? What kind of community could be built uh, in this scenario? Um, and do you see aspects of some of these items here, the keys to community building, um, which is not an exhaustive list, <laughs> um, but do you see some of these aspects in these projects? So. Um, when you're building something, when you're building a community, extending an endless welcome, a repeated welcome, you're welcome on our team, you are welcome, your input is welcome, um, including many different types of expertise on your team, um, technical expertise, subject expertise, um, process management expertise. Um, in this community, um, I think we're often very ambitious regarding what we can accomplish, but being very transparent and telling the truth regarding our limits. Um, and being willing to raise difficult issues when we encounter them or things that maybe people don't wanna talk about or are a little bit beyond um, what, what we might be comfortable with that do affect the quality of the work that we're doing both in building a community and in building open educational resources. Approaching this work requires a certain amount of selflessness. We're trying to solve problems. We're trying to leverage tools and approaches as um, creative ways of doing things. Sometimes we have to step aside, make some space for other people. Often we need to, <laughs> we need to step aside and listen much more than we speak. There needs to be an acceptance of risk, conflict, failure. Um, these are real things that we deal with. Uh, and we're finite people. So sincere apologies when we fail and vulnerability and the acceptance that this is not easy work, um, but it, I think it's worth it. Okay, so here, these are my case studies. We'll see how this goes. Um, the way this works is that the slides are automatically randomized uh, when I open them. So let's see what shows up on the top. Um, and I'm going to spend about two minutes on each of these. I would love to hear um, your thoughts because this does not represent all of the collaborations that are going on. Um, if you have ideas of things 
that you want to, to um, share with other people um, with regard to the title on the slide, Regional Collaborations, Learning and Outreach, put them in the chat. Would love to, um, to hear about them. So let's get started. And I don't know what slide is coming after this one. Um, okay, so there are a couple communities that have been developed um, as on the basis of need. These are um, communities that started in um, the mid 2014, 2016, they're not new. One of them might not exist anymore, but these are wonderful um, places where people got together and said, let's learn. Um, let's get together and share what we know. Let's um, provide training for other people who are getting started. Um, so um, second example, um, did you know that some states are coordinating open education weeks as a state? Wouldn't that save you so much time? Um, other states are building uh, types of um, programming around open education network training um, involving faculty, um, sending them to the summer summit, um, just bringing in lots of people other than librarians. Okay, please put your thoughts in the chat. I would love to see what else um, you think of. All right, next slide, let's see what this is. Okay, um, so my colleague, Steve Skripak and I from the Pamplin College of Business um, created a work together to adapt an open textbook. It's been hugely popular. Uh, and so we get emails, dear Anita, do you have slide decks? Can we customize the text? Is there a quiz bank? Are there lecture notes? So I was very annoyed with these questions for a while because I thought you have a free textbook can you make it yourself. Uh, um, but I decided, you know what, I'm well placed. I, I know people who have done test bank sprints. I can ask them for advice. Um, I can, I have space. I can try to find some money. Um, so let's do this. So we um, hosted a test bank um, sprint in person involving faculty from around the region who had adopted or wanted to adopt the text. Um, I also invited some librarians who said, I'm interested in developing this methodology um, in learning how to do this. So we spent two days working together uh, in a very structured sprint format uh, with lots of mentoring, um, with lots of outside people um, coming in to say, hey, we did this, this is how it worked. Um, and we developed a test bank that has uh, almost 400 questions in it and had a really fun time um, doing this. So this was a really fun regional collaboration, lots of work, um, but really fun. Okay, let's see what's next. All right, how many of you are aware of the regional compacts? So the St Southern Regional Education Board is doing work with regard to dual enrollment. They would love to hear from you if your institution is involved with dual enrollment. Um, dual enrollment is high school students taking college level classes. Um, SREB is, is um, hosting a webinar um, July 28th, um, the link on the page. You'll get these slides so you can see the links. Um, uh, um, shortly, um, but this is a, a wonderful um, way to, to, um, to get involved on a regional basis. Okay, uh, local and regional collaborations in getting started. Um, for examples, Tidewater Community College has a adopting OER in the classroom course. They share this through Canvas Commons. Uh, you can get into it, um, even if you don't have Canvas on your campus. Um, but it's a really great course that explains in their context, how do you do, uh, how do you do, um, how do you get involved in OER at our institution? Um, second one, um, if you have not seen the OER starter kit by Abby Elder at Iowa State University, um, take a look at that. It's not necessarily a collaborative kind of thing, but this is a great way to um, to not have to start from scratch in your instruction when you're onboarding um, faculty to open education. Uh, two more resources. 
Um, some of my colleagues in Virginia work together to develop a virtual asynchronous open textbook workshop. Um, they have provided a link to the workshop, um, some notes um, about the workshop and an outline. Um, you can walk through it yourself if you wish. Uh, this was a really nice way of saving time and adjusting to pandemic, uh, being having so many things online. Um, Pre-pandemic, a colleague, um, my colleague Heather Blicker from uh, then Northern Virginia Community College, now Reynolds Community College, um, she and I created a, a um, synchronous online workshop um, with the Open Education Network um, for her faculty at Northern Virginia Community College and my faculty at Virginia Tech. It was fun. Um, read the summary of lessons learned. Um, we really learned a lot from it. It was wonderful to collaborate. We both felt at the time overwhelmed with our responsibilities and thought it would be fun to, to join forces and, and save, save some time and energy. Okay, let's see uh, what's next. Okay, so some of you were chatting about virtual reality animals. Uh, this is a project that started in the university libraries through a grant. Um, we have turned this over to um, my colleague who is the vet med um, library liaison and they are continuing this, but we've developed um, openly licensed um, virtual reality dog, cow, and then working on a horse. The purpose of this is to be, for students to be able to see inside of an animal that maybe they are um, examining in the lab um, that's live uh, instead of having to euthanize lots of animals um, to see what they look like inside. Um, really interesting project, uh, highly collaborative um, as you might imagine. Um, this is not my area of expertise, but pulling in colleagues from many different parts of the university has been really fruitful in doing projects like this. Okay, um, great. Okay, um, so kudos to those of you who are at institutions that have working groups, campus advisory groups, um, faculty who are involved in uh, liaison, liaising with departments. Um, you're doing amazing work. Um, I can't speak for the work you're doing, but I'm really excited to see those models. We're trying to get something started where I am. Um, I want to add a, a brief note also that um, there's a wonderful video by Elaine Thornton and Jacqueline Mosley. The link is available at the bottom on um, linking open education, open educational resources and their adoption as a DEI concern. Uh, and working through the, that network of advocates um, to let people who care about these things know um, that this is something that they can actually do. Okay, let's see what's next. Uh, okay, um, so this is not regional or local, but I am a big fan of people working together within disciplines. Um, three different projects to note. There are many others. Uh, it would be really fun to see uh, what others you know about, but um, these are, are sort of passion projects from uh, different people. Um, Matt um, DiCarlo from Radford now, Radford University now, Stockton in, um, University in Pennsylvania, um, created op open social work education as a place to collect all of the OER for social work graduate level with the goal of saying, let's build a community, let's build uh, some collaboration uh, in adopting and uh, communicating with one another. Uh, this is a, a wonderful resource. Um, a second one, um, Jennifer Paris and Amanda Taintor, um, both from, um, from College of the Canyons and from Reedley College, both in California, um, have worked together to identify and create and run sprints around developing course materials for early childhood education. This is a really rich site. There's a lot of content in both of these um, related to these particular disciplines. 
Um, it's all open, you can get to it, you can see it. Um, and then thirdly, uh, the Rebus community is a wonderful um, home for finding and sharing projects that are, um, that are specific and are looking for um, contributors, participants, authors, peer reviewers, editors um, within the Rebus community. Uh, Christina Hendricks, who is uh, from um, Canada, has uh, created a place where she is organizing development of nine books in philosophy. Um, this is a very ambitious project. Uh, each book has different editors. Um, there, there is a lot of um, it's a lot of transparency in how things are working. A lot of transparency in contributors, and um, it's really exciting. So these are some really exciting um, collaborative ventures that that are um, ambitious, um, that are happening, that are, are very exciting to, to see. Okay, uh, let's see what's next. All right. Okay, so some of you do committee work, right? Um, sometimes it's fun. Okay, thank you. Um, sometimes you learn a lot when you bring together, uh, when you bring together the, um, people from different institutions who care about some of the same things. Um, there's a, a great deal um, that one can learn. So the um, State Council on Higher Education for Virginia's Open Virginia Advisory Committee, I, I co-led this the last two years. Um, this year um, provided feedback to Chev on some um, strategic planning. Um, created a series of three different webinars, um, public webinars to highlight what's happening in open education um, in Virginia and beyond. Some of them had lightning rounds, some were very focused, um, some had lots of discussion. Um, these are to replace an in-person event that was canceled due to the pandemic. Um, but these sorts of, of um, collaborations um, are very valuable because they bring together multiple um, institutions. Okay, so let's see what else is next. Consortiums. Okay, so consortium initiatives. Um, Viva is the Virginia um, Academic Library Consortium in um, that has around 72 members. Um, and some of the things to point out here are that there is, um, there's community building going on within the um, Open Education Network Viva Coordinating Committee. Um, great place to meet people, find mentors, ask questions. Um, there's collaboration going on between the Virginia Department of Education, um, the Course Mapping Project Task Force, and the Virginia Community College System, um, and as well as emphasis on multi-institutional projects with DEI components as part of the Viva Open Grants. I think I can do one more. Um, oh, this one I love. Um, so my colleague, Robert Browder at Virginia Tech, this is his project. These are his projects. Uh, he works with faculty that are um, doing student capstone projects where students create publications. Students do all the research. They have about five months of writing and work to um, create these kinds of things. Um, Robert has developed a system where he has um, book proposals, um, cons consultations regarding what license the students would like on their work, publication agreements, um, and then he handles production. Uh, so there are five, six different um, uh, different um, publications that have come out of this project. So um, this has been a really fruitful activity. It's highly engaging when students are creating something in when you compare um, student learning in a class that doesn't have this versus one that does. Students are very motivated to actually make something. Um, so this is a really exciting project. So I think I'm probably out of time. Um, I'm curious what's left. Um, in the presentation. Oh, that is the, I got through all the slides. Okay, um, so you'll have access to these slides uh, and um, I, I'm going to, to close this um, just to say thank you for your time. I hope this has been fun and given you a lot of examples 
uh, of collaborations. Uh, would love to see what kinds of um, what kinds of collaborations um, are happening on your campus, um, in your state, in the region, around around the country. Um, these are impactful for um, many reasons, um, both for for equity and access of students to course materials for equity and access to learning, um, as well as um, involving people is a primary sustainability strategy. Um, so um, communities are living, some of these documents are living, these projects are living. So um, thanks for your attention. And um, we have three um, student panelists here. Um, that were selected by the committee, the planning group, and I, and I'm going to uh, just dive into the panel. Stephanie, is that a, a good next step? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Um, so we'll have, um, please stop us when we are running out of time, um, but I'd like for each of you to introduce yourself, um, yourselves, and we'll just go in the order that you are appearing um, on my screen, um, Avery, Brissa, and Avalon. Um, please introduce yourselves. Um, tell us where you're from, um, what you study, um, and then some of you have been involved with campus advocacy. So I um, would love to hear uh, just a, a short um, bit about your role. Yeah, um, I'm Avery Haston. I just want to say I'm so excited to be here. Um, I am an upcoming senior international studies and history student from the University of Arkansas down in Fayetteville. Um, I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I have gotten to do a lot of work with OERs on my campus. Um, specifically my junior year, I was appointed as the director, the student director of open education resources for the associated student government. And so through that position, I got to be a student advocate for OERs and I got to have a seat on our campus OER advisory committee. Um, my name is Bristol Louisa. I am from Orlando, Florida. I am in my third year of studying political science at the University of Central Florida. I have been thoroughly involved in campus advocacy, mainly this past semester, um, where I was working as an intern for Florida Perg Students, a student-run organization that aims to create positive change through organization and mobilization. I was elected the vice president of the UCF organization. Um, and I have also been elected as the president for another student organization at my campus called Wiki Nights. Um, which aims to create open source textbooks while also advocating for OER and promoting affordable textbooks at UCF. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Avalon. I did my undergrad at Virginia Tech where I met Anita. I studied public policy while I was there. And then I just recently graduated from law school at American University in DC. Um, so while at Virginia Tech, I was director of academic affairs for our student government. And in that role, I worked with Anita on doing um, open education outreach with students and engagement, mostly soliciting student opinion and just like spreading the good word of OER on campus. <laughs> Thank you all um, for being here and taking some time out of your summer to uh, or, or your studies and your work um, to, to be with us today. Um, each of you have been involved in campus initiatives or have other observations regarding course materials or policies. I'll ask about those in a minute, um, but I would first love to hear about what kind of options there are for students regarding course materials on your campus and how do you feel about them? Um, and uh, Avery, I see that you're ready to go, so go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so at the University of Arkansas, um, as far as how our course materials work, we have a really great system through our university bookstore. So our faculty are able to submit their syllabi at the beginning of the semester, and then you can just go in and get your books. Um, the only caveat is, is a lot of the times it's not as price friendly as students need. 
Um, so I've found that my fellow peers and I, we often don't take advantage of that because we do want to find cheaper resources, whether that's finding um, going on Amazon, use book sites and trying to find the best deals. Um, our campus also utilizes a lot of online textbook options that also include a lot of online homework sites too. And same, um, my university does about the same thing that Avery's does. Um, it's currently kind of hard to be aware of the existence of any OERs and the options for course materials are primarily directly from the university's bookstore or a secondhand used book rental, um, which often, as you said, also comes from like Amazon or a book rental near the university. Um, I do feel that if OERs were to expand its reach at the university, they would become the main option for many students. Yeah, my undergraduate experience was similar to both Avery and Brissa. Students would comparison shop between the bookstore on campus, uh, online resources like Chegg, Amazon, trying to find the cheapest textbook available. Um, when I got to grad school, it's a little different. For law case books, we're definitely more limited in where we can find textbooks, um, pretty much only through the campus bookstore, Amazon, and then like the direct publisher um, without a lot of like price variability between the three really, um, which is frustrating I know for a lot of my fellow students. Um, luckily we don't have any online like software requirements. So I guess that's one perk. Um, yeah. So how much work do you put into finding assigned course materials at the beginning of the semester? And you can answer this with regard to um, your experience or the experience of friends and roommates. I feel like I spend um, at least a week kind of the first like syllabus week of the semester. And I would say that's definitely accurate with my peers because uh, we always like to say we kind of size up the faculty and sometimes faculty members will be like, you have to have this textbook. Some might be like, it's a great resource to have. It's not necessary for the course because I definitely made that mistake my freshman year of just going in and buying all my textbooks new and then maybe not opening some for some courses or not using it as much as I needed. So I definitely think kind of spending about a week and then if you need it, trying to find the best deal. How about yeah. others? Any um, specific um, workflows that you that you run through? Um, do you find that um, finding the material is at a, a price that you can afford is um, is easy? Is it hard? Is it um, what, what's the general sense? I generally do the same thing Avery does, um, if not longer until it's absolutely necessary to get the textbook. Um, and I hardly ever do get it through the bookstore because the prices are always outrageous. Um, and the only times I ever do is to get access codes needed to complete any assignments for that course. Yeah, I have a similar process. Usually um, shortly before the semester starts, I make a list of all the books that I'll need or that I know about at least in advance. And I start comparison shopping. So I look at um, typically like Amazon, the bookstore, and then I try and find like a third place to kind of add to comparison shop. Um, and I compare not only like purchasing the textbook, but what it is new, used, and if you can rent it and compare like those three prices. And like, there's some personal calculus involved um, for me, like I'm more likely to purchase a book new if I think I will keep it once the course is over with and like we'll use it in the future versus a class that maybe I'm not as interested in personally, like I will be more comfortable renting that and just sort of giving up that amount of money with no return. Um, and I know that like my fellow students like do the same, same thing. Uh, and that bit about waiting and kind of like sussing out professors and seeing like how absolutely necessary a book is, is, is very real, so. Yeah. So independently, each of you in my conversations with you before the panel um, said, first year students, they need advice. 
<laughs> um, we didn't know what to do, what not to do. What advice would you give to first year students? Um, or to their so, parents? <laughs> <laughs> so first year students are definitely a big worry when it comes to the question of textbook prices. And I think almost every student spends more money within their first year than any other year while in college. And that's simply because they just don't know the options that are available to them. Um, especially when colleges like mine push the idea that their bookstore holds the lowest price in the market, you believe them. Um, I would personally advise first years to look into every option available. And I would definitely love to find a way to push OERs into the knowledge of every student body and just find a way to have every student, especially first years, have access to them. I agree, Brissa. That's very, that was the exact advice I would give. Anything else you want to add? I would also caution first year students to wait, like Avery talked about, to see like how your first week of classes goes, to see sort of what materials you might be able to prioritize over others. Um, and also see kind of what informal campus options are available. Um, at, like at the law school, we have a public interest group that like funds internships for students doing like nonprofit work. And one of the ways they make money is by selling donated textbooks to students. Um, and so you can get a $250 textbook from them for $50 the second week of school. So if you can wait, you know, until that time to buy it, you save $200. But that wasn't something I knew about, you know, as a first year student. So just kind of like uh, seeing the environment, seeing what the you know, the communities like what options are available is very helpful. Great. So the used book sales are, are something that um, I, I have seen some institutions, um, student governments take on as a project that um, is a fundraiser for them and also is, is really valuable for um, students who are starting that semester. So, um, we know that a lot of students include Google searching as part of their um, course material um, finding um, process. Um, and we talked a little bit offline about some of the ethical issues of that. What are your thoughts on, um, do, do you want to comment <laughs> on how, Yeah, do you want to comment on, on those practices um, and what, how do, how do you interpret them? What do you think that means um, that there is so much torrenting and um, use of un unauthorized online versions? I, and I should ask, do you, do you agree that there is a lot of that? And um, what are your thoughts? I can start since I'm no longer a student. <laughs> I can speak a little more freely. Um, yeah, so I have I have a big ethical issue with that, mostly because like a, a personal value of mine is paying people for their labor. I don't, you know, I don't support, uh, let's say, ripping off textbook creators who've put this time and effort in. Um, Basically, it's bad for everyone involved. For students, it puts them at risk of academic, you know, honor code violations, puts them at risk for legal issues. Um, it's bad for the textbook creators. It's not great for professors because, you know, that gets built into the reputation of the class, I think, in a lot of campuses as well. Um, so it's definitely a huge problem. I tend not to place blame on the individual level. I think it's more speaks to more of an issue um, systemically about how expensive and unaffordable these course materials are. I agree. And I, um, before I was the director of OER um, through the, my student government, I was actually our director of academic affairs and I worked with our academic integrity office a lot that year. And I got to see a lot of different cases that would come in. And it was so kind of sad just to see how many students, they, it was not malicious in their attempts for them Googling and searching and trying to find additional resources and information online. Um, so it's definitely a real thing. Um, and I also just like to add that I think 
as a student who's paying money to get an education, I don't want to have Google be what I'm relying on for my education because the you can't believe everything you read on the internet. Um, and as I've learned, um, kind of depending on the course matter, the subject, everything's not as black and white. Sure, I could put a math equation into Google and I'm sure that answer will be right. But something that's a little more subjective to a class, you know, definitions um, are different across different subject matters. So that students don't really take that into account. So I think that really affects a student's education. But if we were to provide OERs and more accessible resources, we just wouldn't have that issue. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move us on because I think you have a really nice segue there, Avery, with um, saying, I don't wanna rely on Google for my education. Let's talk a little bit about quality. Um, so once you obtain course materials, and this is related also to a question in the chat, um, what's valuable to you? Um, is it helpful um, if, if you're, is it helpful to have print and digital? Is having just digital okay? Um, do you need certain um, tools to um, work in a digital version that some are helpful, some are not? What, what, um, what do you like to see in your course materials, open or not, um, that is a, a marker of quality? I'm kind of old school, so I prefer to have all my materials in print. I feel like I can just kind of, my degree is that I'm working towards is very just reading and writing heavy. And so I'm reading anywhere between 50 to 100 pages a week. And so it's just easier for me to read. if I can print it out. Um, and I just think I remember things better if I can handwrite any notes in the margins of a text. Um, but another thing I think that is really helpful with like an online textbook, whether it's an OER or not, is whenever there's a, some sort of online homework component, it is really nice if you're like struggling on a topic to be able to click it and it links you back to that direct um, page in the textbook that's talking about that problem and topic that your homework's on. I think that really helps be more efficient when you're studying and trying to learn the the topics. Yeah, and to follow that, um, so within course materials, I think that the most beneficial is probably having digital myself, um, because while it is easier to read with print and be able to make notes and highlight, there's no reason that can't be done digitally, especially if you can print it out, like you said. Um, and I do like having my course materials accessible anywhere, and digital versions are quickly becoming more common. Um, and I think the switch over to digital life during the pandemic just really proved how everything can be remote um, with course materials included. And I would really only push for homework software within digital materials if it really just comes at no cost for the student. Because too often there are students who receive a lower grade in a course than they would have received or they have to drop a course if they just can't afford that homework software. Yeah, I would say to, I guess, to combine both of y'all, having the options is the best option, <laughs> um, especially in terms of accessibility. You know, if you have the, if you can choose between digital um, and hard copy that accommodates people's disabilities, neurodivergence, different learning styles, um, you know, even certain forms of like mental health issues are improved by using a digital form over, you know, print. Um, and I think that students respond best like when they do have that choice and can pick the format that works best for them. Um, but I definitely agree with the homework software. I personally have never found that useful for learning really in any capacity. Um, it mostly feels like busy work or like an attempt to get um, some kind of like base grade for students without actually like really delving into what students understand. Thank you. Uh, and and um, as we're talking, um, please, if you're listening, please um, do enter questions into the Q&A. We would love to have some um, meaty things to discuss. Um, so both of you, all of you have mentioned that you have had leadership, uh, uh, leadership roles within various student-led groups. Um, will you provide some examples of how these groups worked on course material issues? So um, I have been in really important leadership roles this past semester mainly with being elected as president and vice president for this upcoming semester. 
Um, so one of my clubs, Wiki Nights, works, as I said, to create and advocate for OER. And this upcoming semester, we are partnering with a librarian on our campus to make OER more accessible to all students within our university. Um, and working with Florida Perg at UCF, I was the textbook affordability campaign coordinator um, before being elected the vice president. And so at our university, like many in Florida and across the country, we have this policy regarding textbook purchasing called the opt-in um, where you rent the book needed for that semester and the university um, allows you one week for students to opt in to rent said book directly from the bookstore at a discounted price. Um, and last semester we became aware that UCF was considering a change to this policy to have it become opt out instead of in. So that basically just meant that instead of student choosing to have their books at that discounted price um, and added to their tuition, all students were going to be enrolled. And regardless if they were aware of the change by the first week of class, that cost would just be added to their tuition. And we knew that was gonna harm a lot of students. And luckily with being able to form this grand coalition of student groups, such as UCF's Democrats and Republicans and other clubs on campus, we were able to stop the administration from pushing forth the change. And I think that that success and leadership experience pushed me to wanna to do more change for good, especially involving affordability and pushing for that accessibility of OER. Um, so this past year at the University of Arkansas, um, with my position in student government, I was able to sit on, like I mentioned earlier, the OER um, action group. And so that was really fun because I got to start um, and I got to sit in on all of our applications of faculty members who are wanting to either write um, new OERs or convert their courses to it. Um, so one of the things I we ran into is that we weren't going to have enough funding from our campus to support all of the projects, um, which I just think is not cool. Um, if it, it's really hard to like have, we were having to prioritize which ones do we think get it. And I'm like, if we can just save any amount of students money, let's do it. So I was able to work um, with our student Senate and their leftover budget. So we were able to allocate about $30,000 from the student budget directly to um, the OER group to help them fund all nine projects that we had faculty um, apply to do, which was really fun. Um, and that was a great way to kind of just spread the word within student government more and just really because, you know, our student money in student Senate is funded by students, it's their activity fee. So it was a really great, great way to turn that money back around and it be a direct investment into their student experience. Um, we also have been trying to work on our campus with just getting faculty more conscious of textbook costs. So I've gotten to plan a couple events, um, one of which just to show, like I know we've mentioned earlier, like the kind of quality between OERs is I did a PowerPoint presentation, like a Zoom night, and I did about 20 different textbooks where I had students on across campus in different majors and colleges submit their um, text, just random pictures of their textbooks. And then I went and I found an OER from a comparable course and I made them guess which one was the OER and which one was not. And it was really fun to see students struggle because they thought coming in, they were, we were raffling off some AirPods. So the competition was intense. Um, so it was really fun getting to see students really like the quality was equal. They couldn't tell the difference. Um, and so that was a really fun way just to advocate for it and really get the students involved in the process as well. Yeah, my experience was mostly just talking with students and introducing them to the concept of OER. Um, at, this, was, this was like four years ago um, when I was an undergrad, but a lot of students just were unaware that these were even options on our campus unless they specifically had a professor who had designed an OER resource, um, like the business textbook that Anita shared earlier. Um, and I found that it was easiest actually to connect with students to this concept when I got them talking about their textbook costs. And it was sort of like a light would switch on when they would realize that, you know, like there were other options available, that this wasn't something 
like we have to commit to forever. Um, and it was really great to sort of see this like interest pick up while I was there. Great, thank you all. Uh, I know that some of you have also been involved in writing policy and um, that kind of activity. So I do, I do see, see students also involved in, in those kinds of things. Um, so we're, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask a final question. So we're hopefully coming out of a pandemic and the past year has been, um, past year and a half has been very difficult for many people for lots of different reasons. Um, knowing what you know now, um, what do you especially want instructors and college administrators to either know or to do, or, or maybe to remember, <laughs> to keep in mind, um, as, as we look forward to the fall semester, um, what are your hopes that, that, um, um, that you would see um, faculty and administrators um, glom on to? I feel very passionately about this. Um, I did a lot of work with our student government on this topic. So I think personally on my campus and what I saw is kind of everything that came out of 2020 with the pandemic and a lot of the social justice movements is there was a huge conversation on equity and inequity and what that looks like on our campus. And for the first time I saw like my own professors, me not mentioning anything um, them being just more conscious of the material they're requiring and they're asking students to use for their courses. And so it was really nice to see on their end, them kind of putting in the work, if you will, to find if they can work with the library system to find digital downloads that everyone in the course can access or put, you know, instead of us having to rent on Amazon Prime an episode of a movie to watch or TV show to watch for class, that they were able to find and get it reserved through the library system. And I think that came out is just faculty being more conscious of the financial hardship a lot of students went through with the pandemic. Um, and so my biggest advice would be a lot of those barriers students have financially aren't gonna go away and that they were most likely there before the pandemic. Um, and so kind of, I want to make sure people don't, as we kind of move away from it, things are starting to go back to normal that they don't forget the burdens financially that a lot of students have to face, that it is, do I buy the textbook or do I put money away for rent? Um, and I don't think that's a decision. If there's any way to avoid putting a student in that position, I think we should. Um, and so definitely turning to OERs and just making resources more accessible, I think is a great way to fight um, inequity on campus. Yeah, and mine kind of relates to Avery's in a way. Um, I just want to put forth that notion of faculty and professors and admin just to be understanding through everything, because while instructors and admin and faculty had to work through their computers and interact with students that way, many of us still felt the need to teach ourselves more often than not due to the instability of life this past year. And this doesn't just apply to the pandemic and the issues that arose because of it. I think that there just has to be an understanding amongst instructors that things are very different from when they went to college and the issues that existed then exist now in a much larger magnitude, whether it is economical or beyond that. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point and I would love to, you're fine, I would love to hear you expand on that. Um, um, maybe we can in the Q&A, but um, Avalon. I think in addition to the inequity and sort of empathy points that Avery and Brissa raised, another one is just communication with students. I felt like professors this year were more directly engaged in reaching out to students and soliciting student feedback and opinion on how things were going. You know, I had professors ask if we felt like an assignment like was needed even, you know, and gave us sort of options and how we were learning to best fit our needs. Um, and I think that's something that should become standard. I would love to see students more directly engaged with their course content and like deciding, you know, which projects, which things are actually going to help their learning the most. And it'd be great if we can keep sort of all three of these threads going post pandemic. Those are really great insights. Um, thank you for that. 
Um, we do have uh, a few minutes for questions, I believe. Um, I want to ask, though, is there anything else that in any of you three um, presenters would like to add? Um, anything that we haven't talked about that you're like, you know, we didn't talk about a particular topic. You want to raise it? No. Okay. I, I'd like to make one point. Um, when I was an undergrad, I was on the GI Bill. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, that's the military um, education sort of scholarship grant program. Um, so they provided me with a textbook stipend every semester. And that's what I used to pay for my textbooks in college. And every semester they gave me about $1,500. Um, and that was based on them taking into account the average cost of textbooks across the country per semester for students. And so that was something that really spoke to me because it shows that even like the federal government at the Department of Veterans Affairs recognizes that this is a problem and that textbooks are this expensive. And I, I think that it gets lost in conversation a lot that this is a problem that institutions have known about. Um, and I think we need to keep like bringing that point home that it's like beyond time that we've introduced OER um, into schools. Thanks for that. Um, you'll have more opportunities if, if you think of other things that were important that you wanted to um, look into. Um, so we have we do have a few minutes for questions um, and we have two questions right now. Um, I'm gonna start with the second one first. Um, uh, one participant asks, for all of the student panelists, have you had trouble with access codes on a technological level, having them not work, having the wrong one? Um, what is your experience? Yes. I had, so my soft, freshman or sophomore year, um, I was a French minor for a bit. Um, and in my French classes, we actually had all of our homework was online. And some of them are multiple choice questions, but some of them you had to type in. And, you know, taking away that human component of having like a TA, a professor, a faculty member grade your homework, I would lose out on a lot of points and I would have a homework average for a week of being like 50%, 75 percent um, because just the software wasn't able to make those if it wasn't exactly what the textbook the homework software was expecting you know language is language you can invert something there's different ways to say the same thing um, you would get points off um, and sometimes the teacher or my teacher would didn't have time to go back and she wasn't double checking and recorrecting everything and so that's definitely a big technical challenge I had um, with an online homework software. How much do you pay for these homework softwares? I paid for that my French courses, it was $150. And that included, I mean, I was lucky because I got a physical textbook and and that was me buying a used tech, like renting a used textbook and then getting an access code to the online site. And I think Ouch. the only other online homework resource I had was for economics class and that was an inclusive access. And with the homework textbook and the online homework portal, it was hundred over a hundred dollars. And could you keep any of that? Or no. does it just, it just goes away? Yeah. yeah, I think it's a one year yeah. subscription. So I had access to it after the semester, but I couldn't use it after that year. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so you know what I think of that. <laughs> um, so two, two questions. Um, and um, so one attendee is asking, how useful have you found the OER textbook that you've used? Um, are they useful textbooks? Do you find them less helpful than commercial texts? And I know we talked about this a bit before the panel that um, you have not been in a position where you've been in courses where faculty have used um, open textbooks or OER. Um, is there anything that you would, you would want to say about the 
um, usefulness and quality from, um, from your advocacy work or from other contexts that, that might be helpful in answering that kind of question. And no is fine. <laughs> um, so I, personally, I would be thrilled if a professor used OER in a classroom. Um, I've had professors sort of gone around the edges of OER where they'll assign, you know, scholarly articles and things like that that don't require a textbook per se. And we'll find sort of these workarounds to avoid using, you know, copyrighted textbooks. Um, and even that has made a huge difference in my education. I honestly find those kinds of classes more useful because the professor has put thought into what sources they're using. Um, it provides, you know, a greater perspective of the subject instead of, you know, sort of, I think textbooks can sort of give a singular perspective for a lot of topics. Um, and I've also had professors do really great like interactive projects where you know, we don't use a textbook at all, but we actually produce something um, concrete and tangible like work product uh, in our class. And that has also been really helpful. It's just having that hands-on experience. So yeah, I don't really feel that we need to stick with commercial textbooks for quality reasons at all. Uh, okay, and thank you. The um, last question that we have here is, um, have you asked any professors if they could use OER? Um, and if so, what is that experience like for you as a student, maybe as their student or not as their student? Um, have you had that experience? So um, part of the internship with Florida Perg students at UCF, um, before we went full into trying to change that policy that I talked about earlier, we were trying to push for OER and we were communicating with professors and asking them if they could switch and that we were going to do the research for them. And we did have to put a pause to that because of this insane policy that was happening. Um, but in this upcoming semester, we're going to pick that up and hopefully we get some yeses and hopefully we can push that. Um, but I do want to say towards like asking professors and having professors use OERs, um, I do understand that it could be difficult for a professor to switch fully to an OER simply because they will have to remodify their entire course basically. But I do think that changing the course one time for every student to be able to participate is worth it. But I just wanted to add that in. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we are out of questions. Um, so I'd like to, um, I think, turn this back to Stephanie and to the planning group to ask if there's anything that you, anything else that you would want to add um, in terms of, of things that, that um, have come up um, either in the presentation or in the discussion with the students? Uh, so I first want to thank you all for your lovely participation and thoughtful answers, presentations. Um, this has been a fantastic keynote, in my opinion, and that's not because I'm putting it on. It has been very eye-opening and always lovely to hear from students. I saw Avalon put in the chat that she saw in the math courses that students, you know, would put in 0.05, but the correct answer was 0 0.05, and so they'd get it wrong. I can attest as a student who had to do that myself that it happened quite a bit. You're like, but the answer's right, but the system marks it wrong, um, which can really hurt folks, and for us, those classes here on campus, math ones specifically, are some of our highest DNF classes that use those type of systems. So it's a it's a big problem, um, but I find it really y'all are just so inspiring to listen to and so thoughtful. You really know what's going on, and I just want to offer your time. We're at we're at time, but thank you again. And this will be posted on our YouTube page as well as later um, in the week on this 
in the Whova site um, because everyone has access for another three months after today. So anyone who couldn't come at this time will have time to watch it this week um, through Whova. So we have a 15 minute break right now before our next session starts at 1.30. But I once again wanna just thank you all to our attendees, to our panelists, Anita, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much, Stephanie, also for, for your work and um, students, thank you so much for being here and um, really appreciate your, your voice and the things that you're, um, that you're doing in this space. So thank you for, for being part of this work. It's, it's really important to have you here. Yes, so thank you. I will stop the recording now and